Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Odeon Saloon, Odeon Oldies Lecture Series. <laughs> so we're trying to bring the history back to date and, and, and trying to continue with our historical value here. So I really appreciate you guys coming and supporting the Odeon Saloon. George has done such a great job. Thank you, George, for bringing this back to us. So, so I was able to print out this time on I wasn't. One of our friends printed this up for us. Um, our lecture series and our upcoming events. So please grab one of those if you guys don't have one on your way out. And then we'll be also posting this on our own end and amongst all the other groups that we go on to. So tonight, I, I've got the great pleasure of introducing Flynn Caswell of the Union Hotel. Um, he has, has, has they done a remarkable job of restoring this, but they're also our really good friends. And I'm just really excited. I call it my mansion, so I've taken care of it for them. When go out of town and I have to take care of the house as my partner. So I really, I really love, love, love this place. So without further ado, and we will do the raffle afterwards, so don't run them off, okay? Because we've got some two raffles we're going to put out there. But without further ado, Lynn Hasbrook. Greetings all, and uh, welcome to the Union. And also welcome to the Union Hotel. And this is my uh, wife, Katie, who without, without her help, This window right here is probably the best view of the hotel in town. So this um, this photo was this this photo is probably really close to 18. It opened in 1870. I'm going to guess that this is probably 1880 uh, because uh, up top is Carolyn Gruber, Charlie Gruber, and their oldest son. Who ended up being the proprietor in the 1900s? Um, so it's before Charlie died in 1886. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's my guess. So uh, you will notice that it's brick construction, and notice how the border is uh, quite apparent. There's a reason for that. It's called penciling. What they did was they painted the bricks brick red, oddly enough, and then they went back and they painted the border stripes in with gray paint. Oh. And we'll show you that in a later slide. But uh, we have the hardware store, which was originally a, uh, a butcher shop. And then this building over here is a barber shop at this point. Later on, it'll become the Dayton Post Office. So next stop, slide, please. And this is us posing on our heap of boulders which we had to move by hand out to the backyard. This is actually inside the Pony Express uh, courtyard, which the Pony Express building is behind the barbershop. In fact, the barbershop was built inside the old wall. So this is a 14-foot stone wall that surrounds that side yard. That is now thoroughly exposed. Yes. Um, and anyone who knows Tanya Musselman, this is her photo. Yes. Yeah, we were doing our, uh, what was that painting, uh, American Gothic? Yes. 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 <laughs> so the way this all started, next slide please, is that Katie and I are, well, we've been together for seven years, but uh, I was in San Jose and Katie was living in Carson, and we met online. Now, how do you have a, week, a weeknight date with such a, it was like 250 miles. Yeah. It's kind of hard to just drive up for a dinner or something. So what we do is get on the phone. And while we were both on the phone, we both go to Google Earth and zoom around the, uh, the old ghost towns while we were talking on the phone. And it's like, oh, well, turn left on Pike. And then so we found this. So we were zooming around uh, Dayton, and we found this photo. Which is cool. And upon zooming in on that, we found a for sale sign in the window. 
Well, it had been for sale for a long, long time, and nobody had had a use for it. And it was very hard to find it. I finally found it in an MLS commercial listing that was way deep in the internet. And we were able to make contact. Next slide, please. And we were shown the place. This is the ad that we found. And for $150,000 for that amount of square footage, it's like, well, that sounds like a dream come true, but there's got to be something wrong. <laughs> But the next couple of slides are the photos that were in the advertisement. You could scroll through those. That's the saloon. It doesn't look bad. That, that bar there is actually uh, two-thirds of the old bar that still existed. There's a bit missing, so they put this salt. Somebody cut the end off of it and then just stuck it up against the wall. And that's not the original position for that bar. We figured out where it was later. This is, uh, Edna McDermott's bedroom. Edna owned the place from 1950 until she died right there in 1999. Which is interesting because we think she's still there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ghost hunters have confirmed that. Yes. So this is the upstairs parlor that uh, we've turned into our master bedroom. And it's on mm -hmm. the iconography. You have a peace sign, you have yin and yang. You have a walk in SS, which I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but that's all gone. Oh. Or no, that's the swastika. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So we thought, hey, worth taking a look. So we uh, had the had a real estate agent show us, and this is what we found. Mm. This is the inside of the post office. And that was not in the uh, advertisements. <laughs> there was wall to wall junk. And the smell that hit us was just couldn't be believed. So is the hotel and the post office all combined? Is that one purchase for you? Yes. Oh. It's all the same deed. So we're, we actually have two lots. The one, one lot is the hotel, and the next lot over is the old post office and the Pony Express uh, walls. This is the saloon, and uh, it was really kind of adjusted in here to begin with. The staircase is behind that wall on the left, and uh, that really kind of closed up the whole room and made it not very attractive at all. Yeah. Next. That's the other direction. So you remember that original picture with the, the bar and the wall of open space? That's what we found instead. Mm. Mm. Now, it's interesting to know stuff. <laughs> they threw junk in after the picture. Yes, well, they had somebody who was uh, leasing it, who didn't pay any lease, and she collected a lot of stuff and put it in the hotel. So, a bit of a hoarding thing. We did find a few treasures uh, with this picture. I had to clean all that stuff out, and all that stuff's heading out to the back into a big dumpster. And then this sleeping bag here was particularly manky and scary looking, and it's like, oh, pick it up! Oh, oh! There's a brand new air compressor underneath it. <laughs> so there, was, there were some tools hidden that I still have that air compressor, it works great. So part of the uh, real estate deal is we had to take care of everything in the house. So most of this went to the dump. Next, please. And that's our future kitchen. <laughs> More stuff. It looked like uh, the person who was in here wanted to start like either a thrift store or she mentioned a museum. Well, there's nothing there to look at. Uh, there was a pantry room off to the left that was buried like this deep in bags full of old clothing that mostly got moldy in there because the building wasn't really watertight. So we had all this stuff. Next, please. This was the what we called the green room. And uh, it had like a case full of rain cans. I don't know why. Maybe somebody got a good deal on them. But uh, yeah, th this ceiling was a drop ceiling, and when I took it down, right up here, there were what remained of a huge beam that had built in between the floors. And also on the other side, there was a raccoon's nest. That, as soon as I pulled down the ceiling, all the raccoon poop landed on me. Oh. That's, that's currently the rocket room. Oh, the rocket, okay, gotcha. 
we turned it into a into a workshop where painted desert stained glass, and uh, we also built rockets to fly out in the desert. Oh, cool. cool. Next, please. This is the backyard. It's like more of same. <coughs> stuff. Next. There's the back of the Pony Express wall. And it's interesting, this staircase was really scary. I wouldn't have touched it, and yet that's the only time anybody broke in. They climbed up those back stairs, went through the back of the hotel, walked past all my tools, and went to the front windows. And the two front windows on the second floor were the last two windows that actually still worked and the glass was all there. Well, they opened up the sashes and threw rocks through both sashes. So I, we, we discovered it on Dayton Valley Days. We're setting up our little garage sale to sell off some of the extra junk. And I'm wondering, why is there glass in the street? Oh, it's our glass. So we had to replace those windows anyway, so it wasn't a big loss. It was just annoying. And then they didn't take anything? No, well, that was lucky, but I think it was probably just kids on a dare yes. going to the haunted house. This is the inside of the uh, Pony Express yard, what it looked like. There's a refrigerator there. There is four black locust trees in there that when we cut them down, I counted the rings and they probably started as seedlings in the 40s. So they were all volunteers and they were uh, undermining the Pony Express wall and the hotel, so they had to be gotten rid of it. Then also, you'll notice lots and lots of vodka bottles all around. They were all filled with water. Well, why would they be filled with water? Because that's the only way the toilets would work. There was no water in the building. So I guess the person there was going out at night, filling up all the bottles, and then you could force flush with the bottle. Hmm. Please. And every can of um, bad colored magic, magic, magic color paint from Home Depot ended up here. <laughs> and we inherited all that stuff. And this stuff is difficult to get rid of. You can't throw it away when it's liquid. And uh, you can buy a hardware that you mix into the paint, but it's like five dollars a packet for you know five dollars per gallon to make this stuff dry. So I put all these cans out in the yard and just for months I would stir them up and and uh, dry them out a bit at a time and uh, we eventually got rid of them all. 49 cans of paint. Wow. <laughs> And what she was doing was painting the plaster that was peeling off the walls that was covered in wallpapers and just and painting it to make it stick. <laughs> well, yeah, and the more you paint it, the more the plaster would fall away. Yeah. <laughs> so, damn. 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 <laughs> I found that in the yard. I fell in love with the place. Well, yeah, there, that, that was an interesting side story. When the, uh, I knew that there was something up and the real estate agent was showing us, no building could be this cheap for that, for that amount of square footage. And I'm thinking, well, it will be an adventure to see it. And the real estate agent opened the door, and I saw the junk, and the smell hit me. It's like, okay, we're not going to buy a hotel. First thing out of Katie's mouth was, wow, this is fantastic. <laughs> something wrong with my project, I'd always feel it. I may not know what pro pro wrong, but I would feel it. This, no feeling. Nothing was wrong. And so I kind of felt we were invited. So that's pretty cool. Oh, that's a good word. Please. Grab the shovels. So, just to get the junk out of the hotel, this isn't even dem demolition junk. This is just all the stuff that was in there. Two of those, 60 cubic yards. And uh, next, please. This was underneath the carport. The, the trash actually was coming, came out. We had like either six or eight mattress sets that we had to get rid of. And, and they were all like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> next. And the furniture, this, that's a beautiful uh, 30s uh, chair right there. But it was in such bad condition that there's no saving it. And to get it to the dumpster, I had to flatten it out. So I'm with the sawzall cutting through the springs in the frame to get it to flatten. So I could get as much into that dumpster as possible. Next, please. 
Then we had to take care of the trees. And Wilson Tree Work uh, here in town, they gave us a really good bid. They took out seven trees for us. And four of them out of the Pony Express yard, so they needed the boom truck. And they were great. The guy would have a chainsaw in one hand, and he'd saw through it and catch the limb, and then chuck it off to the side. Because one of these trees that was behind the truck, they've already taken out, it out in this picture, but it was overhanging the power line coming into the house. And that's why I didn't try to chop it down myself. That was too scary. They did an excellent job. And next, please. It cleaned up pretty well. But you can see the bad shape this wall is in. Originally, there was uh, another building behind here. You can see the shadow of it. And this, the water all coming off the roof came and probably went on the roof of the building that was behind. But without that building there, the water just came down the wall. And in the winter, that water would soak through the bricks, and even the inside of the wall was wet. And that's what was causing all the, the mortar was eroding out, because that old mortar is pretty much lying in sand. It's not waterproof. <laughs> These are some of the things that we found. So, talking about the line of the sand, this was eaten out. Just this is where the water comes out, this is where there should have been a scupper. So all the water from the roof is coming out here and just eroding the building. And uh, when you're in the inside there, you can see daylight through that wall. So, that was kind of scary. We, we, we called it the river room initially. Yes. <laughs> it's now the laundry room because. Oddly enough, that, that room always it creeps, so we put the washer and dryer there. Whatever's in that room has it to himself. So these are this is what the ceilings look like inside. Because a little bit of uh, lath and plaster, a little bit of water, and it all comes down like that. This is the back bedroom. This doesn't look as bad as I remembered it, but uh, it was still pretty bad. Oh, we had more uh, bed springs here, which I've seen them in antique shops. People put like bottles and stuff in them. We sent them to the dump. Yeah. <laughs> now in the basement, we got a really good uh, bid on plumbing from Jack Rabbit Plumbing. And uh, part of that bid was that I would do all the demo on the plumbing. I had to move it all and get it out of their way. So I thought, oh, this will be fun. I took the sawzall down there, and as soon as I touched the blade of the sawzall on the first pipe, the whole thing fell out in my lap. Oh. And it completely rusted through. So that was it. That, that was easy enough. Now here, this is the floor beams. This is the, the foundation wall. This is what the floor was sitting on. Oh. That was the whole thing. The only thing holding it up was this this rotting out uh, scrap wood. And it had been like that since 1870. That's the, that's the way they put the floor in. Wow. I'll be darn well. And there's the electrical connection. <laughs> <laughs> I, I freaked when I pulled off that panel and saw that. It's like, oh, turn the power off. So when we bought the building, we were assured that the power was turned off. There was no water and everything like that. I went in and flipped the light switch to see if you know, just out of curiosity, the lights came on. The power had been on the whole time. The power company didn't know who was paying for it or if anybody was paying for it. So I said, well, disconnect it, please. Yeah. And I called them out of energy and they said, no, there's no power there. I went, oh, yeah, there is. <laughs> it ain't static electricity. So here comes the fun part. And demolition is, is a lot of hard work, but it's pretty simple and it's just, uh, it makes you feel good. It's very cleansing. Yeah. So the first thing I did, uh, we had the uh, mains disconnected from the breaker box, and then I had the electrician put in a couple of uh, outlets so we could run our power tools off it. But this means that anything in the building, if I find any wire, I can clip it without worrying about lighting myself up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> that was very nice to know. <laughs> Also, the walls upstairs, well, all the walls were pretty much, the, the lath and the plaster were just failing. You touch the wall and the plaster would fall off. It's like the cartoons. Make a loud noise and the ceiling drops, <laughs> drops dust out of you. You know, you should um, talk about is the, why we did our own demolition. And, uh, you know, it being the owner versus having a contractor. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. 
Good point. I know I brought up something. <laughs> so that was, we, when we started doing our own demolition, uh, the fire marshal was over for a visit and she said, oh my God, you gotta stop right now because you're rated commercial. Well, we had already gotten from the, uh, from the county a uh, special use permit for residential. But then, so it was sort of cloudy whether we were commercial or residential at that point. If we're commercial, then we're not allowed to do anything on our own. We'd have to get a contract for a contractor for everybody or for everything, which would have been disastrous because we couldn't afford that. So I think uh, the next day we talked to the commissioners and they said, oh yeah, we had a meeting uh, we didn't tell you about, but we said you classified as a resident owner so you could do your own work. Yay! <laughs> So that probably, between the two of us, we probably saved about $70,000 in labor. Did you live in this, in here as well? Did you? No, we, this is not livable. Well, we didn't have a certificate of occupancy, so we weren't allowed to live in it. I had a house in Carson City, that, and that's where we lived. We that just, was so lucky. Yeah. So, so when you stripped the walls, you took off not only the plaster, but the lath behind it? Yes. Yeah because we were going to use drywall instead. And um, I had to uh, move a couple of walls a few inches here and there. I also had to rebuild a few walls because once you strip the plaster off, it's like, oh, what are they doing here? And there was uh, little oopsies and doorways that they covered up and things like that that I had to repair. Especially downstairs, there was some framing that was really quite iffy that I, I just went ahead and replaced. And what did you do for insulation? Yeah. Um, we insulated the ceiling, and that's about it. We did not insulate the walls because we didn't need to. And actually, that's proven out that it works fine. The, the walls being brick are so massive that we have uh, thermal, uh, thermal mass, and it holds on to the temperature quite well. <coughs> so our heating bills in the winter are not bad at all. And it stays pretty warm in there and pretty cool in there. Yeah, uh -huh. it's the stove special. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you were talking about, and I don't know if it was in the slide, is, is when you do strip these walls, uh, if anybody ever plans on doing this, the what not to do. Oh, yes. Well, I don't know if you had that further on. Yeah, I had it. Uh, okay. So this is the condition of the plaster. A lot of it would just fall off like that. And then uh, what you don't want to do is on the left, you can see I've got lath and plaster on the floor. That was a mistake because you end up trying to play pickup sticks with all the lath with the plaster weight on top of it and you can't get a shovel underneath and it just doesn't, doesn't work. So what I recommend now is to break the plaster off, shovel up the plaster and get rid of that and then take the lath off carefully so you can stack it as you're pulling it off because it was a big mess. So to get rid of all this stuff, the, the carport in the back is still there. So I had to work around that. I built this ramp out of uh, the plywood that they had covering the broken windows. I took that and made a ramp. And taking a wheelbarrow full of plaster, I could run down that ramp, stop really hard at the end, and then dump. That was clever. And that's what it turned out to be like. So I went to the, uh, the Ace Hardware store in Mound House and they were selling replacement lathes for a dollar a stick. And it's like, I'm rich! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so after we got all that cleaned out, it looked pretty good. And the other thing, once you get all the lath out, it's, it's just crazy because it was put in with all these little square lath nails, they're little tiny things which you can't see against the uh, dark wood beams, so I had to run my crowbar along every beam and hear a clink, and it's like, okay, I'll pull that out, because it, drywall won't go on until you get all of those nails out. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is fun. This is uh, in the saloon. Next. I love the, uh, we had a beautiful tiny green ceiling, and the engineer said, oh, that's got to be all pulled out. What? Yep, you got to get rid of it because we're going to put blocking and all sorts of stuff inside that uh, ceiling. And the thing is, is that ceiling was put up with square nails, mm -hmm. and they don't pull out. So the wood just explodes when you're trying to pry it out. The nails do not pull out, and then you got to pull out the nails after the fact, which is pain in the neck. But also, 
showed me some stuff. This is underneath the upstairs bathroom. And the, there's the bathtub there and the drain. And while I'm pulling that stuff out, something zooms past my head. The plumber was having a good time when he was installing the tub. <laughs> and he hit that underneath the tub. And luckily it bounced instead of breaking. It's on the back side, it's got a 1935 tax stamp. So we know when you rank it. We know what plumbing is. Yes. Yeah. And the bathtub, the only way to get it downstairs uh, without a whole army of people is to break it up. So I went out and purchased my first sledgehammer. What was that made of? Cast iron. Yeah, it wasn't, it, was it, was it wasn't like a cloth mm -hmm. or anything yeah. classic. It was a 1930s. Yeah, it was just a plain yeah. terrible stain. So the bathroom actually was uh, originally was room number one. It was a uh, hotel room, and they uh, they leased it out, or the Rivers leased out the building to a mining company back in the 30s and 40s, and they did a lot of uh, modifications, like putting some elect electrical into it. That electrical panel that I showed you downstairs was theirs, and they put in the bathroom. So this all had to go. Then the last really big job that I had, and this actually came later, so this is out of, out of uh, numeric order here, but uh, the old uh, carport. Now the funny thing about tearing down the carport is you could go at it in two ways. Either you could stand underneath on a ladder and cut the beams while you're underneath it, which didn't sound like a good idea, or you could stand on top of it and cut the beams while you're standing on top of it. <laughs> That didn't sound like a good idea either, so I did a combination of both, and I made sure that I got all the connections to the hotel and the building next door disconnected, so it's getting really wobbly here. And then I threw a rope around it and pulled it, and just when it's starting to fall toward me, it's like, is this rope actually long enough? <laughs> it was a pretty spectacular crash. I, I think it, there was like six inches between the, the, the roof and the toes of my boots. <laughs> so we'll go back into the history of things. Sanborn insurance maps are great. This one's from 1895. It shows the neighborhood. It shows uh, the barber shop here. And they don't show the partition inside the building, but the front was the saloon, and the back, where, which is now our kitchen, was all the communal dining hall. Now, this was the building I mentioned that came up or joined the back of the uh, hotel. This is a wooden structure that had five more rooms on the top and uh, a kitchen underneath, an old wood fire kitchen. And then this, we've already dug that out. Bottle diggers in the past have already got them, so we got into it. Uh, I think it was Edna was charging like 20 bucks for all you could dig. And the, so our yard was pretty much trash. There's nothing, nothing in the ground that's that's not broken. Yeah, there was a there was an ice house back there. There was a water closet, another water closet on the uh, edge of the Pony Express yard, uh, the wall there. And this was the palace, which was a small cottage that uh, the groupers actually lived in. They let the uh, clients or the customers at the hotel and they escaped to the back. Uh, two parents and seven kids in a little tiny house like that you see on 8th Street. Uh, just one of those little two-story houses. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture uh, of what Pike Street looked at, looked like before 1870. And you'll notice the union should be right here, but it's not. This is actually the Clark and Seaton Mercantile, which was the building that preceded the union. It was burned out in, well, before 1870. Probably like, yeah, I think the big fire was 1866. So Charlie Gruber bought the ruins and uh, fitted, put a second story on it and fitted it out as the hotel. And there's other clues that show that. But this is interesting. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, uh, union. There's the Quillacy Building and Chase Bistro. That's uh, tap, house. tap House. Let's see, and that is the, uh, that's the grocery store? Uh -huh. yeah. But you'll notice that the, these, these telephones <coughs> have power. A 
they didn't have telephone yet. Yeah. So, power oh, tools. Oh, oh. And what was nice about those, we have these big data cables, these telephone cables that are like two inches in diameter hanging right off in front of the balcony now. And I wish they had buried those because, well, I'm thinking of hanging my laundry to dry on them. <laughs> That'll get Comcast to get out of here. <laughs> So uh, this is the only interior picture we've ever found. This is the bar, and you can see how the bar comes around at an angle here. That was, well, the bar here downstairs, you can see how it comes around at an angle so it doesn't block the window. We had that same situation here, and I think somebody saw it right there, and this part ended up probably in somebody's family room as they cried at the bar. Do we know who's in the picture? Huh? Yeah, that's um, so. The gentleman standing outside the bar is the oldest son, uh, J.C. Gruber, and then that's his two bartenders. I don't remember what their names are from the census, but that's J.C. So this is after Caroline uh, was no longer. She, Caroline was still alive, but she was no longer proprietor. So J.C. took it over. John Charles. They were all named Charles or John Charles or William Charles. I get confused. <laughs> so this is the uh, the last stage, and this is not your standard stage coach that we're used to seeing. This does not have the side doors. This has steps and a back door. So I guess it was probably two benches facing each other. So you had to knock knees with your neighbors on the way in. <clears throat> and this is the ever famous two story outhouse. This one did, must have been after 1895 because it did not show up on the sandboard map. But it was definitely there. And uh, to get to it, you went out the back of that wood building on the second floor, and there was this bridge that took you to the top. And the reason they did that is the only way, if you had a ground level outhouse, you'd have to go down the front stairs, through the saloon, through the dining area, through the kitchen, and then through the yard to get to it. And that's a little bit difficult at 2 o'clock in the morning when you really got to go. So they built this bridge. What remained of it when we bought the place was the Pit of Doom. <laughs> now this pit is 8 feet wide, 14 feet uh, long, and 25 feet deep. Whoa. We know that, uh, well, we, we've heard it told it's 25 feet deep from the model makers, uh -huh. who actually, actually cleaned it out all the way to the bottom at one time. And when we got it, it had filled up to maybe 10 feet deep with garbage. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I found out there was nothing interesting down there, then we just took all the extra soil we had and filled it up because it was just hazardous. Mm -hmm. What was neat about that, though, is it originally it was how Charlie fought fires. It was the sister in town. And so they had, you know, it was full of water until he turned it into the outhouse pit. And mm -hmm. he built the outhouse over top of it. But it was his sister originally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the garbage out there, there's like a house full of carpet in there. There's a barca lounger, mm -hmm. uh, a Uber vacuum cleaner. It's going to be an archaeological dig. Oh, yeah, it'd be fun for somebody in the hundred years. <laughs> yeah, that's the bridge right there. You guys saw the hotel room as well. So, when you use that second floor outhouse, like it would go all the way to the bottom? Yes, they, they actually had uh, ceramic pipes. Oh. So, you, if you were on the bottom floor, there were more stalls on the bottom, but you didn't have to use an umbrella. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it But when you bought it, it just was a hit. Yeah, it just was a hit. And they had, it was actually kind of a tiger trap because they had taken fence boards and just laid them over the top of the pit. And it wasn't very strong, so if you walked on those fence boards, you were going down. They would just snap and you would... Uh, yeah. When Glenn went down at one point, he, like, he lowered himself down and he stood on the top of the heap of the garbage and it was just like tilting and rolling like this and he was like, I, I gotta get off. <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna swallow me up, you'll never see me again. <laughs> But if you ever go to the museum, there is a, uh, a model of the two-story outhouse in the museum here. It's pretty cool. Well, the problem we have now is we filled it up with dirt, and all the trash keeps on compressing, so the yard keeps on sinking. 
So this is uh, in the 50s. You'll notice that the balcony is gone. And they replaced the balcony with these de decorative uh, pilasters. They're wood. And they, were, they looked OK, but no balcony, which was sad. This is Edna McDermott right there. And uh, she was quite well known in the town, a well-loved well resident. At this point, the, the uh, rubber shop is now the post office. Yeah. So she's standing from the post office. She was the postmistress for how many years do we know? Uh, I think her entire time was there. <laughs> so the building to the right, that's the Quillacy's building? This is the Quillacy building, which burned in the 80s. Arson. Hmm. Arson for insurance that way. And there's lots of interesting stuff we found on the way. Uh, this was, as I was explaining, this is the, the add-on building. And you can see where the interior plaster was. There was another room right there. This is the back door to nowhere. That's a second story uh, door, which we now have bolted shut because you don't want to like step out of there. It's a long drop. And also, this is a mystery here. You'll, we were told by all the historians that the Pony Express building, being stone, would have been the first building there. Well, and the brick buildings came later. The stone buildings were built out of uh, mine rubble, and so they had lots of it. And the bricks were actually had to be manufactured. They were more expensive. And the bricks came later. But you'll see here that this stone wall is built up to the brick brick walls of the Union. That doesn't make sense. That suggests that the Union was there before. Yes. You went in order for it. So it was there. So when it was the Carton City Mercantile, that's when it was the Pony Express. Actually, Pony Express building uh, was the Overland Stage first. So it's an Overland Stage building, and then it became the Pony Express in 1861. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought it was 18 months. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So you can see the bean pockets. This is the Pony Express uh, wall on the inside. The bean pockets made it up to the next slide. The bean pockets in the side of the hotel. So I don't know whether those were cut or, or formed uh, when they were making the wall, but there they are. And uh, our basin has filled them in, keeps them watertight. 